Well, thank you for David, Rachel and Nathan for leading the first part of us. And weren't those photographs wonderful? Yes. You've had a really good time there. You know, I would like a ministry of visiting missionaries. <laughs> I could think of Hawaii, <laughs> Brazil, that was quite nice. Well, I can tell you about three missionaries who... Um, served in Brazil from 1925 to 1935. They were famous in their day. They were known as the Three Freds. Ah, oh, people heard about Three Freds. Yeah. I think their names were Fred Dawson, Fred Wright, and Fred Roberts. And two of them were from Australia and the other from Ireland. And they worked out in Brazil, and they were going down the Amazon, and after 10 years, they set off down to visit new people down the Amazon, and they set off in 1935, and they were attacked. Their boat was smashed up, their belongings were stolen, and they were murdered. But it wasn't an utter disaster, because a young Englishman, very posh, very proper, called Len Harris, went out with UFM to follow in their footsteps. And he would tell of how he was preaching these places. And there were people throwing uh, spears, shooting arrows, uh, waving bush knives uh, hostilely at him while he preached. But he and his wife Doris, they did a good work over there down the Amazon until they returned to this country. And he became director of uh, the Unevangelized Fields Mission, UFM. And then he retired to Broadstairs. And he was a deacon in the church there. And I went to be minister there just after he had died. I never met him. But people in the church told me stories about him very fondly, and they would tell me how he would pray. And at every prayer meeting, he would pray this. He would say, Lord, you've done it before. Do it again. Lord, you've done it before. Do it again. And that is the outline of Psalm 126. Psalm 126, verses 1 to 3 are, Lord, you've done it before. And verses 4 to 6 are a prayer. Do it again. It's a very uh, well-balanced uh, poem. The translation that we have, the, two, uh, the 1984 version of the NIV, isn't clear. It translates verse 1 as when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion. But if you look at the footnote... And every more modern translation agrees it should be translated when the Lord restored the fortunes to Zion. Could just be, just be translated when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion. But then verse 4 can't be translated that way. It doesn't make sense when he's brought back the captives. They pray that he'll bring back the captives. So it should be translated consistently. Verse 1, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion. Verse 4, the prayer. Sorry. Verse 1, when the Lord restored the fortunes to Zion. And then verse 4, the prayer, restore our fortunes, O Lord. So that's the outline. So verses 1 to 3, remember what God has done. When the Lord restored the fortunes to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. The first singers of this song would have been those in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah and they would have remembered the days before the Lord restored their fortunes, the days when they were exiles in Babylon. They would remember their, the intense heat. They would remember the hard work. They would remember that they were captives in a foreign country. How could they sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? It was so depressing. It was so difficult. They were the subculture. It was, they were so poor, and it was so hot, and it was so hard work, and it was so depressing. 
Everything looked bleak. Everything looked dark. Everything was terrible. All they had were the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah that the Lord was going to restore his people. But that, well, you couldn't believe that. It just seemed so impossible, so unlikely to come true. All they did was look down a dark tunnel. And then suddenly, overnight, the Babylonian Empire fell to the Persians. There was a regime change. And now the Persian leaders decided they wanted these uh, Jews to return to, uh, to Judea. Go back to their land. Not only go back to their land, but rebuild their city. Indeed, they were going to finance the rebuilding project. Now, that was a miracle and a half, wasn't it? It just, it just seemed so impossible. And then overnight it materializes and the wind of the Spirit was blowing in it. And so they sang, when the Lord restored the fortunes to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. But it wasn't only remembering these days when God brought back the exiles from Babylon. There were other times when God restored the fortunes for his people. What about the days of Moses? When they were slaves in Egypt. And God worked miraculously, supernaturally, miraculously, and delivered them and took them through, marching through the wilderness where their shoes didn't wear out, where they were fed with manna, where water came from the rock, and they were taken into the promised land. What about the days of David when the Philistines were uh, conquering the people? There the little boy defeats the enemy, and God delivers the people. But it didn't only happen on a national scale. Sometimes it was just a tribal area that God delivered when he raised up the judges like Gideon or, or Samson. And sometimes it happened to an individual. If you read Job 42 verse 10, it says, when God restored the fortunes of Job. God is a God who restores the fortunes to his people. And we are to remember these days. Remember what God has done. Because first of all, in verse 1, what God does is incredible. Verse 1, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Some people, as the footnote says, say, think this means that they were healthy. And therefore they got a good night's sleep and had a nice dream. They weren't all feverish and hallucinating. But it's better than they slept well. It's as if these people had to pinch themselves to see if they were awake. It was so wonderful what God was doing. It was so incredible. And that's what happens when God moves in revival power. When God restores the fortunes to his people. It is so incredible. You can't, well, you find it difficult to believe it's really happening. The early church was born on the day of Pentecost, AD 33. 5,000 people converted in one day. The apostles went out preaching throughout the world. By AD 100, it is estimated that there were 8,000 Christians in the world. But the revival continued to spread until by the time of Constantine, 312 AD, 50% of the Roman Empire were Christians. In AD 100, there were 8,000 Christians. By AD 350, there were over 34 million Christians. <laughs> That's 4,000 times more. You know, just think, if each of us reached 4,000 people, and yet that was what every Christian in the world had done, as it were. The church just exploded across the Roman Empire. In England, in the days of John Wycliffe, in a thousand years after Constantine, Wycliffe lived roughly 1329 to 1384. 
and he had his poor preachers who he sent out and they would go out preaching and you can still walk around the countryside and you can see these stone pillars which they would have as preaching posts and they would ride to them or walk to them and the people would gather there and they would preach to them. They were what we would call today evangelicals. And in the days of Wycliffe, it was said if you were walking to a town and you met two people on the road, you could guarantee that one of them was a Lollard. 50% of our country following the word of God. Absolutely fantastic. Or think of Germany in the days of Martin Luther. Or think of Britain and America in the days of Wesley and Whitfield. When Wesley and Whitfield went out preaching, the people would, they would leave their work and they would come and you would have a, a town that had, what, 10,000 people in it and you would have 8,000 in this congregation. And he would preach and the power of God was there. Such was the power of God in his preaching that when someone said, we want to uh, print your sermons, he said, well, you can print your, the sermons, but you'll never get the thunder and lightning in them because there was that sense of the presence of God at work, that people were trembling under the preaching, that the miners were coming up and, and these hard, burly Bristol miners, they were crying tears that were making gutters in the dirt in their face. And so many were converted everywhere they went that new churches had to be formed all over the country. It was just so exciting, you couldn't believe it. They, they, they found, it, found it difficult to believe it themselves. It was so incredible. I was preaching at Lansdowne about 10 years ago. And after the morning service, I went into the hub and a, a guy came to talk to me, and a very old man, and he told me he'd been a missionary out in Rwanda. So I thought I would impress him. Oh, yes, I've read a little bit about the revival in Rwanda. Oh, yes, what have you read, he said. So I scratched my head <laughs> and told him what I had read. Oh, he said, he said. A few days later, three books came through the uh, post to me at Lansdowne, uh, written by this guy, H.H. H. Osborne. He was the scholar on the revival in Rwanda. Actually, he'd been a young missionary there himself in the revival back in the 30s. And he wrote about it. And the incredible thing about this revival, a phenomenal revival across East Africa, and yet it was reaching people, as David said earlier, who didn't have a Christian heritage. This wasn't people who knew the Bible stories from school or Sunday school. These people, all they knew was demonology, paganism, ancestor worship. They were being converted in their droves. And God restores the fortunes to his people. We were like those who dream. This is what's been happening in Korea in the last 20, 30 years. It's what happened in Brazil in the last 40, 50 years. It's what's been happening in China. Uh, my older brother has had quite a lot to do with what's happening in China. He told me about a year ago, he preached one Sunday in England, and he preached the sermon, and after the sermon the people said, well, thank you very much. Who have we got preaching next week? <laughs> the next week, he was in China, he preached exactly the same sermon, and 50 people responded at the end of the sermon. In England, nobody. There, what would make us Decent congregation in many churches in England. Just the power of God is at work. God is restoring the fortunes to his people. In 1904, a young miner, Evan Roberts, 27 years old, he met with a group of young people and they prayed that God would send down the Holy Spirit in power upon them. And God came upon them in revival power. They started preaching throughout South Wales. And in a hundred days... On average, 1,000 people were converted every single day. Within three months, 5 to 10% of the population of South Wales became Christians. It was incredible. The newspapers were full of it. They would have a, a, a section on the news, a section on the sport, and a section on the revival. When God works, we are like those who dream. We, we just didn't think it could be like this. What God does is incredible, but also the beginning of verse 2 and the end of verse 3, kind of a brackets, what God does is thrilling. Verse 2, our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. The end of verse 3, and we are filled with joy. It's thrilling. 
Read the stories of 1904 in Wales when the miners down the pit would stop for their lunch break and kneel down and have a prayer meeting together. The, the stories when the, the, the parents had been put in the workhouse, but now they were brought back to be part of the family because their children had been converted. The stories. How the judges were presented with white gloves in the law courts because there was absolutely no crime. <laughs> and how the men who had been drunks were converted. One guy always ro roll home drunk. But this day he called in at the church. He got saved. And he came home singing the praises of Jesus Christ. He opened the door and the dog bit him. It didn't recognize him. <laughs> it was just so incredible, so thrilling what God is doing. And what God does is supernatural. Look at the end of verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3. It was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. It's not because we planned it well. It's not because we had good organization. It wasn't because we had nice tunes, good music, good entertainment, good publicity. The Lord is doing something. This is the work of God. This is the hand of the Lord. What God is doing. Let me illustrate this for you. Monday, June the 21st, 1630. Whenever it's June the 21st, it's the longest day of the year, remember this story. Up in Scotland, uh, 30 miles west of Edinburgh is a, a, a village town called Shots. And there's a church there called the Kirk of Shots. And being uh, Presbyterians, they only have communion a, a couple of times a year, but they make a great big show of it, and so they would have a whole week of meetings. And they had had meetings with different preachers every day of the week. And on the Sunday, they thought, this is so good, we'll have a special meeting tomorrow, Monday, the 21st of June, 1630. They had a prayer meeting, and they prayed all night long. And they wondered who they should invite to preach. And there was a guy who had applied for ordination, but Archbishop Lord didn't like him, so wouldn't let him be ordained. But he was, did a bit of preaching. A young guy, 27-year-old, called John Livingstone. So they asked him if he would preach. Well, he walked out into the um, fields to pray, to prepare his heart. And a fear came upon him. He thought, I can't do this. And so he decided to walk away and leave, <laughs> leave them alone. And as he was walking away, he felt a real sense that he was grieving the Spirit of God. So he turned around, he repented, and walked back to preach. He preached from Ezekiel. He wasn't a great preacher. He was a bit dull, a bit heavy, a bit boring, and he preached for an hour and a half. After an hour and a half of his preaching... He was outside the church. There were well over a thousand people on the slope just leading up from the church listening to him. And he had preached for an hour and a half. And it began to drizzle with rain. And he said in his sermon, he says, isn't God gracious to filter the heavens so that the fire and brimstone we deserve doesn't fall upon us? but instead we get the gentle rain. And it was as if God fell upon them. And over 500 people were added to the churches in that area around Shots, converted in that one sermon. I told you he had preached for an hour and a half. The power of God came upon him, and he preached with liberty for another hour. Two and a half hour sermon. And it was so powerful. And yet he never, ever preached like that again in his life. It wasn't something that he could conjure up, something that he could manipulate, something that he could cause. This was God. When God stepped in, 
when God rent the heavens and came down, when the Lord was with his people and the power of God was upon them. And it was supernatural. When Francis Dixon came to Lansdowne Baptist Church in 1946, he had about, I don't know, 40 people in the church, most of them sitting on the back row or the choir behind him. Within six weeks, the choir, and he had had a bust up and the choir had left. But that first year, about 100 men were converted under his ministry. That's two a week. That's one male at every service. Phenomenal. He would have appeals and they would be kneeling at the front, weeping, praying to God to have mercy upon their souls. When God moves, it is supernatural. So remember what God has done. History is full of what God has done. That leads us to the second half. Lord, you've done it before. Do it again. Verses 4 to 6. Longing for God to do it again. And there is absolutely no reason I know of why God cannot do it here. Indeed, there's so many things happening that we think that maybe, maybe God is going to do something great. There must be this longing for it. There are two pictures here in verses 4 to 6. The first picture in verse 4 is of streams in the Negev. This is the sudden, dramatic downpour of rain causing rushing water through the wadis. It's divine sovereignty. It's revival with a capital R. The other picture is verses 5 and 6, which is the farmer and his crops, the man who sows in tears and will reap with songs of joy. And it's the slow, predictable work of sowing the seed and reaping a harvest. It's very much human responsibility. It's revival with a small R. But put them both together, and you have the doctrine of revival. First of all, then, verse 4, streams in the desert. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. The Negev is the area. If you go 15 miles just down the hill from Jerusalem to Jericho and you're at the top of the um, Dead Sea and then you go down south. If you're driving, you drive a couple of hours down south to the top of the Red Sea to Elat and the Bay of Aqaba. That area between um, uh, Elat and Jericho is semi-desert pretty much 100% desert, but they call it semi-desert. If you go further, you get into the Sinai Desert. This is called the Negev. Oh, one of the most fantastic places in the world. I loved it when I was out there. I spent all my holidays. Well, after, for the first few months, I thought I ought to go to all the important sites. And then afterwards, I spent all my holidays just hitchhiking down to the desert. Oh, it was so lovely and warm. There was Qumran there. There was swimming amongst the corals in the Red Sea. It was fantastic, but it was dry. It never rained. No rain at all. It was just desert. Glorious stars. I've never seen so many stars just lying in my sleeping bag on the the, the sand, just looking up at the stars. But every now and again, there's a thunderstorm, a cloudburst, and the water pours on the hills, and it comes running down the hills, and it runs into the gullies and forms these wadis, these dry riverbeds for most of the year. And the water is now surging through these wadis so much that the bridges are washed away, the roads are washed away, the power of the water just irrigates everything. The flowers start to grow along the edges of the wadi, and the desert begins to bloom. Yesterday, it was as dry as dry could be. Today, a surging river. I remember walking along one of these when the water was charging through them and seeing some school children just walking to school. They have several miles to walk, and they just said that normally they just walk in the riverbed. But today, it's just surging water going through it. And sometimes God moves. That has been dry There's been no life there. It's just been a desert. And suddenly the heavens open and the Lord sends down his blessing and then there's power of God surging through. And the desert becomes a garden. In 1859, David Morgan was a normal preacher in Wales. Say he was a normal preacher in Wales. He wasn't a great preacher. 
never had much success in his ministry. But he says he went to bed like a lamb. And God met with him. And he says when he woke up the next day, he was like a lion. And for a year or so, his ministry sent shockwaves through uh, the country. He and uh, Humphrey Jones, they had a ministry that, that led revival throughout Wales for a year or so. And then, David Morgan says, he went to bed like a lion. The Spirit, the glory of God moved. And he woke up like a lion and never had much fruitful ministry again. It's what God does. And God sends streams in the desert. That's why we pray here, verse 4. It's a prayer. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Let's be those who are continually banging on the gates of glory, saying, Lord, send the Holy Spirit down in power. Lord, you've done it before. Do it again. Streams in the desert. Verses 5 and 6 of the farmer and the crop. There is the danger that those who have experienced that sudden outpouring of the Holy Spirit in reviving power, that they can just sit down and wait for God to do it again. There's a sense in which if this is a sovereign work of God, then there's nothing we can do but just sit and wait for God to do it again. And people have been sitting and waiting for God to do it again for decades and decades and decades. And they've been dying. Their brothers and sisters have been dying. The children have been dying. And the churches are closing because they've just been waiting for God to do it again. Now there is a sense in which we're pleading with God to do it again. But there's a sense in which we're going to get up and we're going to sow the seed. And we're going to sow in tears. We're going to be doing the work. I mean, think about you when you say grace before a meal. Dear Lord, we thank you that you provide for all our needs. We thank you that everything we have comes from you. You give us everything and you provide for all our needs. Thank you very much. Where's the dinner? Oh, I'm expecting the Lord to provide it. <laughs> well, I haven't got any food. I'm expecting the Lord to provide it. We've just said grace and now we're waiting for it to materialize. Now, that's not the way it works, is it? We recognize the sovereignty of God in all these things, but we also recognize the human responsibility. We go to Sainsbury's, or we dig potatoes in the garden, or go around and visit the neighbors at dinner time. <laughs> Dear Moody, that pray as if everything depends upon God, and work as if everything depends upon you. William Carey, the great missionary to India, preached his famous sermon, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. We pray, restore our fortunes again like streams in the Negev, and we go out sowing our seed. So look at the sower and his tears here in verses 5 and 6. Those who sow in tears will reap the songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy. It's not enough to sow wisely. It's not enough to sow generously. We have to sow in tears. What does that mean? Well, it means that sowing is costly. You see, the farmer, he's got his bag of wheat. And he's got his little family that are hungry. And he thinks, I could give them this food. And they could turn it into bread. And they could eat. But I've got to go and sow the seed. There might be a bad harvest, and then they starve earlier. What should I do? Daddy, give me some bread. I, I want some of that seed to eat. No, no, I'm going to sow it. And as he just throws it away, throws it away, throws away the food that his kids want to eat, his heart 
is breaking. This is so hard, yet I've got to do it because this is the law of the harvest. And as his heart breaks, so the tears roll down his cheeks and land on some of the seed that he sows. But if he doesn't give the seed, if he keeps it for their food, they will die. He has to scatter the seed. But it's costly. Very costly. Think of the young couple dedicated to running the youth work in the church. They take the young people away on camp. They give their evenings to running the youth work. They use their car to transport the young people. They use their home to host the young people. They invest their money in the young people. The young people break their hearts with all their problems, but they still love these young people, and they take them on holiday, and they pour out their hearts into these young people, and though it breaks their hearts, they sow in tears. But as the years go by, they reap with songs of joy. I think of the couple that's been saving up for their retirement. They're looking forward to that cruise. Oh, how much they want to see the northern lights. And then there's a single parent really struggling. And so they take all their savings and they give it to the young person. And though it breaks their heart, they know they're investing in the kingdom and they have a sense of joy in what they're doing. And it may, it builds a relationship that's going to last forever. But it's costly. It's hard work. This isn't easy. This isn't uh, a pleasure experience. This is sowing in tears. This is doing the work of God. This isn't having a religious hobby. This is being part of the law of the kingdom. And we sow in tears. And then look at the sower and his seed in verse 6. He who goes out weeping, carrying his seed to sow. He's not just walking along, dum da dum da dum da dum da dum and one day, oh, it's a nice day, good day for sowing, and oh, and here's a nice bit of field all ready to sow, and oh, look, I've got some seed, I can sow, oh, I'll do it. Not at all, it doesn't happen by accident. This is done deliberately. He's planned this. He's prepared for this. He's saved for this. He's worked for it. And now he goes out carrying his seed to sow. It's all done deliberately. It's like the parents, the grandparents, who have prayed for their grandson every day since he was born, praying that God would save his soul, praying that God would work in his life. And now the grandson is a teenager and has come to their house to stay. And they are looking for an opportunity to sow a seed in his heart. It's something they're preparing to do, planning to do, deliberately wanting to do. Sow that seed in his soul. Or you've got a neighbor. You've lived next to your neighbor for some time and you've been kind and loving to your neighbor, building up a relationship. Because you know if you're going to talk to your neighbor about her soul or his soul, you have to earn the right. If you just go blasting in and saying, are you ready to die? You're going to ostracize them. If you say, are you saved, neighbor? You're not going to win them. You're going to drive them away. You've got to, you've got to love them and build that, that right to talk to them about the things of God. And you've been building that relationship. And now the time comes. And you're going to sow a seed that you have been planning to sow. You go out carrying your seed to sow, looking for that opportunity. And then verse 6, the sower as an individual. Verse 4 seems to be all about God doing the work. Verse 5 is about those, it's the people doing the work. But verse 6 is the individual, the one who goes out weeping. And you know, If the church doesn't do it, you can do it. You can say, I'm going to sow seed. 
And by the time I get to the end of my life and walk from time into eternity, I get to be able to look back and see lots of seed that I have deliberately sown. Even if others don't, I will. And the results, verses 5 and 6, in due time we will reap a harvest. You know, the only reason the church of Jesus Christ exists today is because God, in his sovereign grace, has given blessing to the preaching of the gospel and the sharing of the good news and the sowing of seed. It's the only reason we exist today. And yet we are global, worldwide, because God is gracious and blesses the work. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. This is um, the verse here is the verse that that old hymn, Bringing in the Sheaves, is based upon. Who remembers singing, Bringing in the Sheaves? Oh, we certainly sang it a lot down in Somerset. Yeah, I, I thought we wouldn't sing it tonight. But you know, when we sow seed, it will lead to a harvest. We shall bring forth fruit in season. Elizabeth Elliot died 10 weeks ago. She was 88 years old. When she was 29, she was a young mum with a 10-year-old daughter, and she and her husband were missionaries in Ecuador. Her husband and some others went to try and contact an unreached people group. They, they, they landed their plane, they were by the riverside, and the Alka Indians came and clubbed them to death. And now Elizabeth Elliot at 29, was a widow, single mum, and the people who had murdered her husband were the people group she was trying to reach. And her heart was broken. There were so many tears. And yet God, in his sovereign grace, opened the door that she was able to make contact with them, reach them, minister to them, and leave a church amongst them. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. But of course, you should shoot me really, because I haven't even reached the heart of this psalm. Because the psalm doesn't really point to you and me. It points to Jesus Christ. Who was it sowed in tears in the Garden of Gethsemane? Who was it sowed in blood at Golgotha? And who was it since Pentecost has been reaping with songs of joy? It's our Savior. Our Savior is also the seed, the grain of seed that falls into the ground and dies and produces much fruit. And it is our Savior who will return with songs of joy of joy. We sang when peace like a river and, and the last verse um, uh, we, we quoted the third verse last week in the sermon it's quite relevant having both of them but it's, uh, it's about uh, our goal isn't the grave but the sky and the Lord shall return the trumpet shall sound the Lord shall return praise the Lord praise the Lord O oh my soul he will return with songs of triumph. In the meantime, may he restore our fortunes. In the meantime, may we be committed to hammering on the gate of heaven. Lord, open the windows of heaven and pour down your blessing. And may we be seeking to sow seed generously, wisely, and with tears. So let us Commit ourselves to praying and sowing because, Lord, you've done it before. Do it again. You ready? Lord, you've done it before. Do it again. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the gospel is the power of God to the salvation of everyone who believes. That there's hope for lost men and women everywhere. 
We pray that you would help us as individuals and as a church to sow the seed. And we pray that you would restore our fortunes like streams in the desert. And we pray that we shall not keep withering in the desert, but we shall see the desert begin to bloom, the sheaves coming in, the king of kings seeing the travail of his soul and being satisfied. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've done in the past. Thank you for what you're doing elsewhere. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, we pray.